I'm Alison Dyke and I work for the Stockholm Environment Institute at the University of York. I'm involved with the OPAL project um, and another, a number of other sort of citizen science projects um, and I have particular interest in kind of tree health and plant biosecurity. So what I've brought with me today is a beetle. It's the Asian longhorn beetle, Anaplophora glabrinensis. It's native or most commonly found in China and the Korean peninsula where it lives in the woods um, in relative balance. But when it finds its way out of its normal range, um, and indeed when it was found in the UK in 2012 by a member of the public in a breeding population in a wood in Kent, it has um, an unfortunate and deadly appetite for a large number of UK tree species. So when that member of the public found one of these beetles in the woods and thought, that's a very unusual looking beetle. It's very big, it's spotty, it's quite pretty. They thought it was worth reporting. And the consequences of them reporting their finding of this beetle were predetermined. So what happened was that forest research went out and they did a survey of the trees around where this beetle had been found and every tree where they found signs of the beetle was felled. Then, within a 100 metre radius of those first trees that were found to be infested, every single possible host tree for this beetle was also felled. So they had all of these concentric circles around the trees that they found. And then any other trees that they found within that 100 metre circle that were also infested, they drew another circle around and felled all of the possible host trees within that circle as well. So net result of a member of the public finding this beetle and reporting it was that over 1,000 trees were felled. So this, that was in 2013. As far as we know now... This, be this outbreak has been eradicated. There aren't any more beetles. So this seems like a reasonably good outcome for that reporting. The beetle hasn't managed to extend further into the wider environment, as far as we know. It's no longer here. In a more recent example, last autumn in 2015, um, a wasp, uh, the oriental chestnut gall wasp, was found for the first time in the UK also, I think, in Kent. So, there is a network of tree health volunteers under a project called Observatory. They're quite highly trained volunteers, and they go out and they look for things which may be a potential threat to trees in the UK. They send their volunteers out to survey areas around the south of England where they thought this wasp might be. And it so happened that one of those volunteers found some <coughs> oriental... Uh, chestnut gall wasps on some chestnut trees in St Albans. Now, the oriental chestnut gall wasp isn't a deadly pest. It causes galls on the leaves of chestnut trees. It can possibly affect the um, timber production of those trees and the growth rate. The result of that finding was also predetermined. Those trees were felled. And in that local area, these trees were known as a source of chestnuts that people went out and picked. They were culturally important trees, but those trees were immediately gone. This year, that survey of chestnut trees in the south of England was repeated, and the oriental chestnut gall wasp was found in over 40 new sites. So in that case, it was a bit of a failure, really, because those trees have been lost from the local community the pest is out in the wider community. It's, it's no longer in a state where it's controllable. So when citizen science has those kind of consequences, it becomes a real eth ethical issue. And we know from anecdotal evidence that citizen science volunteers may be less likely to report a pest or disease when they know that the outcome may be the destruction of an area which is important to them. So that's one example of consequences. So there are also consequences at a remove as well. So in terms of what happens to citizen science data, some citizen science data is available freely. 
Other citizen science data you might have to pay for, or you might have to pay for certain types of data. So I think there's an ethical <coughs> issue around that. There's also an ethical issue if the data is commercially valuable. So for instance, the Millennium Seed Bank, which is based at Kew, sends volunteers out to collect the, the trees, sorry, the seeds of UK tree species to make a UK seed bank. So that's a really fantastic resource for researchers, but it's also really commercially important because there's a, um, a real shortage <coughs> of UK um, grown and native seed trees. And I think the issue there is that there are these ethical issues that maybe don't get thought about at the beginning of a project, so they're unexplored. There are also unintended consequences in citizen science, and I think quite often in environmental citizen science there's a blurred boundary between citizen science and encouraging environmental behaviour change. So the participants don't necessarily know that they're being urged to change their behaviour, and that the projects take um, a kind of data deficit model. So um, there's a, a gap in knowledge if people go out and do a citizen science activity, they will learn more about it, therefore they'll care more about it, and they'll change their behaviour. And we, we know from research that that really doesn't work. However, there is this um, impetus for people to change their behaviour through citizen science. So, what do we do about it? Well, obviously being upfront with your volunteers about the data and what it'll be used for is very important and what the consequences are going to be. But that doesn't completely cover it, because there are often underlying ethical issues that rise up through citizen science. So in the case of tree health and plant, plant health management, those kind of underlying issues around plant health management, which are contested, don't get um, brought through into the citizen <coughs> science. And I think that is really what we need to address in citizen science. So I think really there's a responsibility to the participants which comes with the, that's, that's the trade-off to having participants collect data for you. There is a, there's a responsibility to them. And I think in environmental citizen science we have these two very kind of distinct modes of participant or of participation. So there's the kind of Alan Irwin model of citizen science where it's all about empowerment um, and democratisation of science and very much at the, um, the kind of co-production end of the spectrum. And there's also a contributory model, which is where most environmental citizen science in the UK kind of fits. Um, and that's where the examples that I've drawn on come from. And I think probably what we need to be doing is to be trying to move that contributory mode <coughs> further into the thinking of the um, co-production mode so that we are actually drawing the ethical issues further into the project earlier at an earlier stage. So, thank you.